Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to share some of my excitement about the opportunity in Africa, and that is the industrialization and structural transformation, and uh, how to have quick wins and uh, to make success breathe success and uh, transform the destiny in Africa. Currently, African countries are trapped in poverty. And, uh, but I strongly believe poverty is not a destiny. Because personally, I was born in Taiwan in 1952. At that time, Taiwan was as poor as almost every country in Africa. But now, Taiwan China is a high income economy. I went to work in mainland China in 1979. At that time, per capita GDP in China was less than one third of the average in sub saharan African countries. And today, China is a high middle income country and on the way to become a high income country by the time maybe 2020. And not only the places where I was born and the places where I work, and you can see some other East Asian economies like Korea. In the 1950s, Korea was one of the poorest country, post-colonial economies in the world. And now, Korea is a high-income economy. And so it's possible to get rid of poverty trap and to grow dynamically for decades and become middle-income and high-income. And we know that once upon a time, all the countries in the world were poor, including the high-income country today. And when they were poor, there's one unique feature. They all rely on agriculture for their lives. 90%, 95% of their population live in rural areas and rely on agriculture for their livings. And uh, there's also one unique feature. All the country now become high income. They all rely on the transformation from agricultural to manufacturing and then to the post-manufacturing stage. No exception except for a few of your producing rich country. And those are just a few exceptions. And Africa is poor because African country has not completed the transition, the transition yet. As you can see, the export of African country today you know, over 7-12% of them were primary goods, either agricultural or the resources. And especially in the resources of this country, their government, you know, uh, budget rely heavily on resources. And we know that resources are a lot of, you know, burn and bust. And uh, so it's not only the productivity level is low, but also it's very volatile. And so I think that we all agree with this. Otherwise, we won't have this seminar today. But the issue is the how to achieve the transformation from agrarian primary based economy to the industrialization and the crime later to become high income and a post industrialization. And for this, I think industrial policy will be necessary because in this structural transformation, you need to have a first movers. And the first movers, certainly, you know, it has a lot of risk. Uh, and they can be either a failure or a success. If it's a failure, the first mover bear all the cost. And send a signal to other people, we are not ready and the direction is wrong. And other people don't have to you know, encounter similar failures. And it can be a success. If it's a success, a success then you're going to have someone to follow to entry. And, and then competition comes, and the first mover will not have a monopoly rent. So you can see there are some kind of asymmetry between the cost of values and the gain of success. And no matter it's a failure or a success, it produces useful information for other peoples. And under this kind of situation, if agents are rational, it would be better for them to wait until to see someone are successful. But if you do not have a first movers, then you cannot have the structural transformation. So you need to have the government to compensate for this kind of externality issues. And secondly, the probability for the first mover to be successful 
not only rely on the entrepreneurship of the first mover, also rely on many other coordination in the improvement of some kind of hard and soft infrastructure. Because, for example, if you want to move from agriculture to manufacturing sectors, you need to make investment. And the capital requirement become larger than agricultural households. So you need to have a financial institution to mobilize the financial resources for the investment. But also, this new industry can be risky, so you need to have financial institution to spread the risk. And an individual entrepreneur will not be able to make this kind of financial improvement, that uh, uh, institutional improvement, uh, uh, by itself. And not only the soft infrastructure like it, human capitals, and also the hard infrastructure like you need to have electricity, you need to have transportation, you need to have port facilities. Those kind of things cannot be endogenized in the individual's effort, internalized in the individual effort. So you need to have the government to coordinate those kind of changes, either by different private sectors, or some kind, sometimes the government need to provide those kind of coordination itself. And, 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 and <clears throat> And so that is the reason why the government need to play this kind of coordination role and as well as, as to compensate for the externalities. And uh, for the government to play the role, industrial policy will be required because sometimes the coordination will be sector specific. If you want to go to certain sectors, the infrastructure for those kind of sectors will be different from the infrastructure for other sectors. For example, human capital. If you want to go to agroprocessing, the human capital requirement will be different from go to that, that manufacturing. And uh, infrastructure can also be different. You know, for agriculture, you need to have irrigation, but for the industrial sector, you need to have power, you need to have port facilities. And if the government has unlimited enough resources, then it will be easy the government improve all necessary infrastructures. And, uh, and, and, but resources for the government is limited. And also implementation capacity for the government is limited. And so as a result, the government need to use its limited resources and implementation capacity strategically according to what kind of sectors that they want to promote and what kind of infrastructure or hard and soft infrastructure improvement will be desirable for those kind of sectors. And that is what we call industrial policy. And, uh, <coughs> you know, but for the industrial policy to be successful, you need to meet a certain requirement. The requirement is that the industrial policy should propose, propose, promote the sectors which the countries has the latent competitive advantages. What I call latent competitive advantages is that the sectors, the country can have the lowest possible factor cost of, protect, uh, factor cost of production. That is consistent with the comparative advantage determined by their endowment structure. The factor cost of production should be the lowest among in the world. But to be competitive in the global markets, it's a competition of the total cost. The total cost has two components. One is factor cost of production. The other one is transaction cost. Transaction cost related to the infrastructure as well as the institution, business environment and so on. If the infrastructure and the business environment are poor, even the factor cost of production is low, but transaction cost can be so high, so as a result, total cost will be too high. And uh, the industrial policy should try to you know, improve the business environment as well as the infrastructure in order to lower the transaction cost. And once transaction cost is low, then the total cost will be competitive, and this industry can become competitive industry quickly. And in the past, there are many industrial policies, but most of them failed. The main reason is that they are too ambitious. They try to target certain kind of sectors which look very sexy, very modern, but they are very capital intensive. They uh, against the country's competitive advantages. As a result, factor cost of production in the country will be too high. Even with the government help, the sector can be built up. And in a lower country, in a low-income country, the transaction cost by definition would be higher than the country with a high income. As a result, total cost would be too high. And uh, 
under this kind of situation, with, even with the government support to build this industry, and you have those kind of firm, this kind of firm because their financial costs are too high, and so they need to receive subsidies all the time if the government help them to do the coordination and so on. And that, from what I see, is the main reason why the industrial policy in the past failed mostly. But the issue is that how can you identify the sector which you have latent competitive advantages? It become a challenge in a theoretical and a policy issues. And uh, from historical experience, we can learn a lot. Because all the successful countries, they all practiced industrial policies. Starting from the 16th century, when England wanted to catch up Netherlands in the world textile sectors. And up to the recent time, all the successful countries, they all have some kind of industrial policies. But there's one thing in common. In general, industrial policy would be successful if they target, if they use dynamic growing country as reference, one thing. The secondly, they target the tradable sectors in the dynamic growing country, the second criterion. The third criterion is that the country they use as a reference, in general, their per capita GDP is not too far away. It's about 100%, 200% higher at most. Uh, uh, those are the three criteria for successful industrial policy. And then if you look into the past, how come that most industrial policy fails? In general, they are too ambitious. They took a country, their per capita income might be 10 times, 20 times higher than theirs, and they tried to build up the industry in those kind of reference country. For example, in the 1950s, China wanted to overtake Britain in 10 years. China wanted to catch up U.S. in 15 years. But per capita income in China at that time was only 5% of the per capita income of the Britain and the U.S. And as a result, even China was able to build up those kind of industries. But they were very, com they were very uncompetitive because factor cost as well as transaction cost in China is too high. And they rely on all kind of protection to survive. And, and so that's one, one thing I learned from the history. So based on this, you know, and I try to understand how come that the successful industrial policy should target in a country those kind of characteristics. The first one is that certainly you need to look into country with similar endowment structure so they can have similar uh, 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 competitive advantages. Because, you know, endowment structure, you know, determine the competitive advantages. And if a country, they're growing dynamically for several decades, then most of the industries in the country should be consistent with the country's competitive advantage. Otherwise, they cannot grow in dynamically for several decades. Okay. But if they are growing dynamically for several decades, that means they must accumulate capital quickly. So industry in the past, they used to have competitive advantages. They are going to lose competitive advantages. And so they are going to be their sunset industries. But if your competitive advantages, endowment structure, are it's not too far away from the reference country, their sunset industry will be a sunrise industry. So that's the basic principle to identify the latent compared advantages. The country growing dynamically and their per capita income is not too far away from yours. Then their tradable sectors. Latent compared advantages. And uh, follow these ideas, then there's a golden opportunity for industrialization in Africa. Because we know that the few successful catching up country since the Second World War, in general, they captured a window opportunity for the relocation of land manufacturing due to the rising of wages in the successful country. For example, in the post-World War II, the U.S. wage rate rose, and so U.S. lost competitive advantages in the land manufacturing sector like the, the garment, textile, and electronics. And at that time, Japan captured that opportunity and it became a very successful country in the 1950s, 1960s. And by the time, due to the success of the past, past two decades, wage rate in Japan rose. And at that time, the Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore captured that opportunity to enter into the light manufacturing sectors. And they became the Asian Tigers. And about the time of the 1980s, their wage rate also rose. 
And they lost competitive advantages in those kind of light manufacturing cities. And China, at the time, captured the opportunity and growing dynamically for three decades now. And China now reached the same stage as Japan in the 1960s, and uh, the, the, the Asian tigers in the 1980s, China is about to relocate its light manufacturing sectors. And uh, this idea actually already practiced in Africa. One of the most successful African countries is Mauritius. In the 1960s, everyone thought Mauritius was a hopeless country. But actually now, Mauritius was most, is most successful African country. Its per capita GDP is already exceeding 10,000 US dollars. And how could Mauritius be successful? Actually, in the 1970s, Mauritius captured the opportunity of the riding wages in Taiwan and Hong Kong and developed industrial park and actively invite the relocation of textile and garment from Taiwan and Hong Kong. And at that time, Mauritius Paketa G. So that consistent with my principles. And now, you know, that Mauritius became industrialized. It transformed from a mono economy of, you know, sugar production now to be an industrialized African uh, successful cases. And as I mentioned, the rise of China will be a huge opportunity for Africa. Because in the 1960s, the total employment of workers in manufacturing sectors in Japan was 9.7 million. In the 1980s, the total employment of manufacturing workers in Korea was 2.3 million. In Taiwan, about one and a half million, and uh, Hong Kong, about a million, and uh, Singapore half a million. This time, China in the light manufacturing sectors alone employ 85 million workers. 85 million workers in the light manufacturing sectors. And they are about to be relocated to other low-income countries. And does this idea work in African countries? Can we really you know, learn from the past experiences and to duplicate the same quick success and uh, facilitating the structural transformation in Africa or not. And I'm delighted that uh, 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 Ambassador Unido uh, is here because she created two su quick success in African country. In a very short period of time, they captured the opportunity and created a huge number of jobs. The first one is the shoe factory in Huajian. And uh, you know, in when I was at the World Bank, as a chief economist, I started to you know, advocate the ideas and to showcase the opportunity that can be available for African country. And I'm very delighted that the Prime Minister of Malaysia, uh, 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 the Prime Minister, uh, the Prime Minister uh, of Malaysia of the Ethiopian, and you know he, you know, listened to this uh, opportunities, and he went to. China to do the investment promotion and invite Fajian Shoes factory to relocate the production to Ethiopia. And uh, with you know, the, the entrepreneurship of Ambassador Hai, they quickly create 2,000 jobs in a year. And uh, you know, more than double the expo of shoes from, Africa, uh, from Ethiopia to the global market. And uh, by the end of the second year, 2013, that they already created about 4,000 jobs. And uh, before 2012, no one really believed Ethiopia can be a manufacturing floor to produce light manufacturing products for the global markets. But with the success of Fangen, you know, people convinced it's possible. And, and, uh, so, and also the government also knows how to really capture this opportunity. So in uh, 2013, the Ethiopian government you know, built up another industrial park uh, near the Addis Ababa. And uh, the first phase of the industrial park plans to build a 22 factory unit. But within three months, all those 20 units has been you know, leased by light manufacturing doing expo uh, 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 to the global markets. And international bio also comes to Africa because now they you know, see it's possible and the cost in Africa is much lower than in China. And especially in Africa, you can also 
and now have the benefit of custom duty because export from low income country in Africa, they don't have to pay custom duty for the importing country. And this is not only a story in Ethiopia. You know, after understanding the success of Ethiopia, Rwanda also wanted to have similar success. So, you know, the President Kagame started to have active investment promotion and invite Helen High to help set up a, a garment factory there. And, you know, they decided to make the investment in February this year and uh, recruit 3, 300 workers. And it was training, and uh, by the time in May, they already employed 500 workers. And by the time of August, they started to do the export. And now this, com this company, this factory, become the largest employ employer in Rwanda. And in the past, no one really believed Rwanda can be a manufacturing floor for the global market. So from all this, I think that poverty is not a destiny. And diversification and a continuous industrial upgrading is the path to you know, generate jobs and uh, to achieve prosperities. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the dynamic growth and the rising wages in China will be an opportunity for African country. And not only China, other emerging market economy, when their wage rise, they will also have to relocate their light manufacturing sectors. And African country, if they can capture these opportunities, I think that they can you know, grow as dynamically as the East Asian economy. Because fundamentally, all the successful country, they start their structure transformation from light manufacturing and not opportunity there. And hopefully, that through our you know, work, we can really see that African country capture this opportunity and become as successful as other you know, East Asian economies and other successful countries in the world. And I have two books to elaborate my ideas. One is the new structure economics, and I published that before I left the World Bank, and it can be downloaded from the World Bank website, 3D. And the other book called The Quest for Prosperity, and it's published by the Princeton Universities, and uh, you know, I have more elaboration about my idea in those two publications. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Justin, um, and who set up our next speaker fantastically well. Um, Alan High, who, you, as you heard, has been very active in the industrialization uh, in, in East and Central Africa. Um,